Good afternoon and welcome to this week's IGC UN's webinar Focus on Geothermal, which is presented by Think Geoenergy and Energy Change. My name is Janur Bosgurt, and today I welcome Joseph Scherer, the CEO of Green Fire Energy, a company developing and implementing innovative geothermal technology to accelerate the world's transition to clean and renewable energy. Joe is an experienced attorney of 33 years in project financing and was the head of the credit finance practice at Cooley LLP. His financing experience includes representation of a wide range of established emerging companies and their financing sources ranging from venture capitalists to money center banks. Between 86 and 1987, Joseph Burke is a project developer and acted as project counsel for cogeneration projects with international power technology. He has substantial project finance experience, both international and domestic, including various renewable energy projects. Today, we are glad to welcome him here to talk about economic models enabled by closed loop technology. We are looking forward to an interesting presentation. And Joe, the floor is yours. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. At uh, Greenfire, we've been focused on our closed loop approach to geothermal for the last eight years. And as you'd expect, strategizing and implementing an economic model for our closed loop technology uh, has been critical to our planning and success, both in designing and implementing actual projects and in attracting investors. Um, as it's public knowledge now that we've been com we've completed a series financing with some of the world's biggest uh, oil and gas companies, in particular Baker Hughes, Valorac Tubes, and Helmer and Hain, uh, just in uh, a few months ago. Uh, it's fair to say that the economic model <clears throat> enabled by closed loop, our, our closed loop approach, is being accepted by knowledgeable industry experts as well. So let's start with some of the problems that plague. <clears throat> Excuse me, plague the conventional geothermal development. It's a long time to revenue um, has been a problem. And this has been uh, uh, from an NREL study uh, from 2001, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, predicts a seven to 10 year time span for conventional geothermal. And uh, if you break that down into some of the components, the resource uh, procurement identification, maybe a couple of years, exploration and uh, uh, confirmation, uh, maybe three years. Uh, permits and initial development can take a long time. Um, and uh, especially when you have exploratory wells that need to be drilled and permitted. And so maybe uh, up to four years on that. But then you need to drill the wells and you need to uh, build the power plant. And uh, that's how you get out, I believe, to the seven to 10 years. So time to revenue is a challenge for most economic models for conventional geothermal. Another problem is high costs or perceived high costs. There's a high front end uh, cost and capital costs, which are exploration costs to identify and test the resource. Legal costs, <laughs> as, a law, as a former lawyer, uh, we have to pay our lawyers a lot of money. Um, it's a good thing, uh, but it is a lot of money. So, and uh, uh, putting together all of the components together that, uh, for a new geothermal project is a lot of work from many perspectives. Then you have the permitting process, the concessions that need to be put and kept in place with a number of environmental uh, concerns uh, to be addressed uh, on a continuing basis in many locations. You have to drill the wells, that's huge. The infrastructure, the construction, uh, the power plant, the transmission, uh, all those things, these things contribute to what is perceived as a high cost. Another problem that plagues conventional geothermal is a perception of high risk. So the conventional technology uh, accesses on average only 10% of the available heat. So with all these costs for only 10% of the resource, it's perceived as a high risk um, adventure. And 22% of uh, geothermal wells can have been described and studied um, and uh, um, the success of geothermal wells, International Finance Corporation put this together, 22% uh, could be described as failures. So with 10% access uh, by, of the heat accessed by uh, conventional technology, uh, that contributes uh, to the risk compared to the uh, available heat. 
the benefits of closed loop technology for power production and direct use are many. Um, we, <coughs> we extract heat from the full spectrum of geothermal resources and access to uh, hotter temperatures than conventional technology. And this guarantees, we can guarantee heat production to the surface. And this permits the use of optimized working fluids to transport heat. Uh, Green Fire has used uh, principally water, but we've also used and tested supercritical CO2 as a working fluid in one of our um, early demonstration projects. The, uh, this enables the resource sustainability um, with little or no water consumption, and I'll give you an example of that. And it has many other environmental advantages as well. Um, geothermal, compared to other uh, uh, technology, energy technologies, including wind and thermal, uh, wind and solar, has a number of um, is generally general conventional geothermal is generally considered uh, very good from an environmental perspective. A closed loop geothermal is significantly better from an air and water quality um, uh, point of view. You're not mixing with the working fluids or, re or pulling the working fluids out from land usage. It's a small footprint. Um, public safety, uh, we're not fracking in the, the resource, of, at least with our closed loop approach. And from wildlife preservation, there are advantages as well. But let's go ahead. So we're talking about closed loop geothermal. What is it? Let's. <laughs> This is a simplistic diagram, um, but conventional hydrothermal system will typically have an injection well into a fractured resource. It's either uh, naturally fractured or artificially fractured, and the water needs to pick up the heat going across that fracture zone into a production well and up to the surface for power production. Um, uh, with closed loop, all of that can occur in a closed loop. So you're not reliant on the fracture zone and you can get into a uh, plastic zone and, and hotter and deeper uh, resources as well. Uh, but this is a, we have many variations on our closed loop approach. This is a U-loop architecture, um, but in terms of generals, in, in a general understanding of what closed loop is, that's what's on the right here. Okay, um, so, Let's uh, also uh, look at uh, two of the major factors in geothermal. Um, and this is a simplistic diagram with temperature on the vertical axis, permeability, water resource, and pressure on the, um, the other, uh, the horizontal axis. So with apologies for the simplicity of this diagram, let's look at the geothermal across uh, world across these ranges. Conventional geothermal is fabulous in the range where it's best suited. Uh, however, we can often retrofit existing wells where, for some reason, they're not productive. Um, and, uh, but just because a resource isn't good for conventional geothermal doesn't necessarily mean that we're in a hot, dry, rock resource. Indeed, there is a huge range of resources that we call the middle range of permeability and water availability where we can use our closed loop approach. Of course, many of these resources are in existing geothermal areas where convection isn't sufficient for conventional geothermal to work, but we can capture the heat with a closed loop approach from what convection does exist, thereby expanding the existing resources and opening up an entirely new geothermal areas for development. Of course, hot dry rock, is at high temperature and very low permeability, and that we have closed loop projects that are focused on hot, dry rock as well. And we model across this whole range, of course. What's the scale that's potential with, uh, as the business models um, will depend on scale, of course, right? Um, what's the scale that's potential with closed loop? Uh, this is our, from our demonstration project funded by the California Energy Commission uh, back uh, concluded in 2019. Um, we worked at COSO, which is a large geothermal location in Southern California near the Mojave Desert. And it currently produces at about 130 uh, megawatts. But we uh, have a paper, our report to the California Energy Commission that shows that with closed loop uh, geothermal approach to the entire resource, it's an underground mountain of heat there and very well studied. We were able to use three of those studies and our own experience and testing there to show that with a closed loop approach, you could get to two gigawatts of power. 
So there's great potential with uh, expansion of existing resources with closed loop geothermal. So um, how can we uh, leverage existing geothermal resources and infrastructure, which has been our approach so far to uh, closed loop technology? Well, there are the unproductive geothermal wells we've talked about, and we can retrofit those. There is also depleted or declining geothermal reservoirs, um, which uh, given the conventional technology often is depleting those uh, reservoirs. So, but using those reservoirs is a, a big is a big advantage because we know a lot about those reservoirs and they've been producing supposedly for a number of years too. And the leases and the permits are all in, all in place for existing geothermal operations. Uh, the power purchase agreements are in place. Yes, they can be modified, but the parties are in place and the current environment, they're getting um, uh, uh, more green energy, baseload green energy into the um, electricity grid is not a problem, but negotiating and putting these agreements in place is easier if you already have existing agreements in place. But the site infrastructure is a huge factor. Um, uh, some new geothermal projects, you simply can't reach the resource. The roads don't exist. <laughs> but if you're working with a, uh, uh, an existing geothermal resource, then many of the infrastructure problems were, um, are simply not an issue. And that's another great reason to work with existing geothermal owners and resources. And what about transmitting to the grid? Interconnection, transmission, already in place and can be easily expanded if necessary. So let me give you an example of a closed loop system and how it works. And this is uh, what we call our uh, green loop. Our technology is called green loop for steam and two phase wells. Um, and this is actually a, 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 a diagram of a, a, a implementation of our technology at the geysers, which is the largest geothermal location in the world. You've probably heard of it if you're a geothermal person. And uh, it's here in Northern California where we are. And what we do is tailor our closed loop solutions for the resource and the customer. In this case, the geysers is a steam dominated and partially two phase dominated uh, resource. Two phase meaning partial steam and liquid. So um, let's look at the closed loop. Cold water goes down uh, in this downboard heat exchanger, which is a vacuum insulated tube supplied by one of our strategic partners, uh, Valorec. And the cold water picks up the heat of the resource, of course, comes up hot, and it can be applied to different work uh, surface systems. This one shows a heat exchanger for an, a traditional ORC system, organic Rankine cycle system, but flash and other systems can be developed as well. We're focused on the downbore approach. But where does the heat come from? From the feed zones, from that steam coming in um, through the perforated liner, condensing on the downbore heat exchanger, um, transferring the latent heat of vaporization, which is a lot of heat because it's a phase change energy event, and the condensation goes to the bottom of the well, and we uh, design these uh, distances of the downbore heat exchanger in the well so that uh, we ensure that the, um, the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the condensate is sufficient to push the uh, steam, which is now actually liquid, back into the resource. And that has a great benefit for sustainability and uh, avoiding decline in the resource, which a traditional flash system will cause decline. Why? Because the water is coming to the surface and you lose the water at the surface. This approach is only bringing the heat to the surface with a working fluid. All of the resource fluid, steam or two-phase fluids stay in the resource, so you don't need injection wells. And it's environmentally superior because as you probably know in California, it's <laughs> water is at a premium. You know, we need to save it. So uh, we can also use closed loop for direct use. Um, and direct use is very popular in many areas of the world, particularly Europe now. Um, and you can see how a similar system down bore 
can simply be taken, take that closed loop and, uh, and move it to heat exchangers on the surface with heat pumps. And this has a number of many adva of advantages because we can use these, we can apply a closed loop system and use those resources close to the heat users. One of the problems with direct use is the thermal transportation problem at the surface. But if you bring, if you can use a closed loop to bring the geothermal to the heat use location, that solves one of the problems for direct use of, uh, of thermal energy. And of course, some resources are just better for direct use than for thermal energy, uh, for, for the direct use of thermal energy, as opposed to electricity power production. So um, our, from a business model approach, we have closed loop uh, technology. We have the alternative business model should create some superior economics, right? The one I've uh, referenced mostly so far is looking at existing geothermal resources to uh, start with a retrofit of some existing wells, sometimes individually, sometimes as a group. It can be done quickly over the course of say six months. There's no drilling involved. It's very low cost and risk because you know all about the resource. You're working with existing wells. Um, and then that serves, and this is the goal of every one of these projects, as to be a proof of concept for expanding more with new wells in the existing resource. So taking the, the, the retrofit knowledge and opportunities and moving those into bigger operations within the existing fields with technology and a designed and tailored closed loop approach that has proven out to work within that existing uh, geothermal field. And this can restore, restore the damaged fields as for example, our project at uh, the geysers here in Northern California. So, and of course use a lot of heat that's not otherwise used. A further goal uh, is to develop new field projects with the experience and the knowledge of how the closed loop can apply in existing uh, fields that are underutilized. So let's look at the, how conventional technology versus closed loop technology works on a time to revenue basis. Again, from the NREL report from uh, the U.S. Uh, Geothermal Power Production District Heating Market Report that the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, here in the U.S. published in 2021, there is a seven to 10 year um, project timeline that's anticipated for a new geothermal project. But if we start with a um, uh, operator growth model that uh, we've been using uh, that closed loop permits, uh, starting with a retrofit project, we can get that done in a year. We can do an expansion project and drilling some new wells to expand that technology into the broader resource within three years. And of course, if we're looking at a new field development, we can do that faster too. And the, the, the reason uh, being that we know, we know the resource and we know with, with closed loop, it decreases uh, many of the risks associated uh, that apply to the long seven to 10 year average for geothermal project development. The conventional geothermal uh, technology um, is also, uh, well, it's wonderful where it works. Right, and nothing better than a fabulous uh, geothermal well. But what if it doesn't work? Another business model for closed loop is using closed loop in a hybrid fashion with conventional geothermal to de-risk geothermal, uh, conventional geothermal. So let's, um, and we have uh, customers that are looking at with conventional geothermal or conventional geothermal tar targets, hitting the right fractures, having the permeability and water resource in that fractured area to have a great conventional geothermal technology. And if they get that, fabulous, they're dead. But if they don't, what do they do with the well? Do they simply have a plug and abandon liability or have they designed it so they could use our closed loop technology to do it, uh, a retrofit of the initially unproductive wells? And then um, with that knowledge, expand the resource and in the process, uh, preserve the resource so the resource does not degrade further. So adding closed loop to conventional is another de-risking and another uh, business model. We call it a hybrid model. 
So um, we um, a closed loop can decrease the time to revenue. There's no additional drilling for, re for well retrofits, obviously, and there's no additional permitting of new power purchase agreements uh, required. We can lower the cost because it leverages the existing uh, geothermal wells and reservoirs. And it facilitates the direct use where uh, power production is not economic. And we leverage um, the leases and the permits and the power purchase agreements and all the site infrastructure we, we discussed. Um, we can also reduce risks because risk is across in a permeability and temperature spectrum so that we can design the geo um, a closed loop well to be most appropriate for that point on the spectrum that is where the heat is uh, being harvested from. And we can use the existing uh, data and knowledge of geothermal wells in those resources to do our sophisticated modeling that determines the techno-economic feasibility of a project before the large um, costs of geothermal are incurred. And this results, we believe, in superior economics, and that's the new business model that closed loop enables, in our view. So, in summary, we uh, we have the we have various new business models, and that can actually accelerate geothermal projects. And this is a big advantage from a financing point of view. So, we've talked about. Uh, some an example of our, our closed loop design, some uh, patented um, closed loop designs that uh, we provide uh, that are innovative. And we do sophisticated well uh, resource modeling because there are many factors, as you can, as you know, that will go into determining exactly the, the best uh, design for a particular resource. We're a bit, we have the ability to execute projects with a strategic partner. Um, several of which are a part of our investor group. And we can leverage these underutilized assets, the well fields and infrastructure transmission, as we discussed with either retrofits, increasing expansion, and also with greenfield projects. So all of this should create various different business models to increase profit, reduce and reduce risk. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm happy to go to the question and answers. Thank you, Dilo. It was really very interesting and fascinating to see how it works. And we can really utilize this green resource now in a more economical manner, most probably all over the world. Uh, I also would like to thank to the attendees for their contribution with the questions. So let me start with one of the first questions asking, is there a depth limitation to implement a closed loop system? Uh, depth was the question. Depth or depth, li depth limitation. I mean, at what depth you expect to? Oh yeah. Well, there's no, yeah. there's no real, yeah. And that is, uh, that's a good question because many people ask whether the, what are the limits of closed loop? And there aren't really limits, uh, other than from an economic point of view. There's a let, there's a cost benefit analysis as you make the well uh, deeper and hotter um, there <laughs> uh, it's going to cost more it's a it's more tubing it's more uh, vacuum insulated tubing if you're using that it's more drilling um, but the economic so each project is a cost benefit analysis uh, for that resource now there are temperature uh, limits in the um, in the world for drilling, uh, and we're happy to work with Baker Hughes. I know they've uh, done a project where they got to 500 degrees C uh, once, but that is not common, of course. It's very high high temperature. But one of the advantages of closed loop is you can uh, go to high temperatures and uh, still produce because you're still bringing uh, you're using a working fluid to get to those uh, high temperatures. So there's no real um, uh, necessary uh, absolute technical limit other than uh, you know, from the drilling world. So if, for example, you're using an architecture that requires a uh, directional uh, drilling and completion of, say, a U-loop structure as opposed to a coaxial structure, such as I've shown on most of these slides, uh, coaxial structure, you can drill blind. Uh, and um, and not meet up, not have to meet up with something. But if you're using a U-loop structure, you're going to need to connect uh, wells 
And then there are temperature limits that from the oil and gas industry um, for uh, what you can do with directional drilling. Uh, but those are uh, what you're using coaxial systems we don't need to worry about. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, another attendee is wondering uh, what are the technologies exist to increase downhole heat exchange? If is there any radiator type of exchangers? If there, if there, uh, what is the last part of the question? Uh, is there any radiator type of exchanger? Yeah, there are um, the various uh, work. We work with uh, Valorec as a strategic partner, and uh, we've uh, so far worked um, in three locations with their vacuum insulated tubing as part of the downhole heat exchanger. So we put a liner on, and I'll go back to my diagram for this. So we we put a liner on the outside of the vacuum ins insulated tubing, and this is the vacuum insulated tubing that preserves the heat all the way up to the surface. But there are other alternatives um, to vacuum insulated tubing, but vacuum insulated tubing does have uh, a very uh, a uh, very strong insulation capability, as you would expect. So yes, there are some other alternatives um, to the downboard heat exchanger uh, uh, inside tubing and insulation, but the vacuum insulated tubing works very well. Is that responsive to the question though? Yeah, exactly. And there is one more, I think a bit uh, related to this one, uh, where another attendee is wondering, why don't you control the pressure in your coaxial system to maintain the fluid in one phase region? He thinks this might increase the heat extraction performance of the system. Yeah, good question. Uh, we do, uh, because we control the working fluid 100%, uh, it's in a closed loop. We control the chemistry and we control the temperature. Um, and the temperature is uh, mostly controlled by the speed of the flow of the working fluid. The faster you flow the, 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 the fluid, the cooler the outside of the downbore heat exchanger will be. Um, and that sets the, um, uh, the saturation temperature and saturation pressure within the well so that it actually attracts the, the, um, the steam, uh, in this case, or the two-phase fluid into the resource and causes the uh, cond condensation to occur. So uh, we, and we are often asked by our customers, well, we have, we as an operator have an existing ORC system or a flash system, and we would like you to develop the downboard heat exchanger so as to match our current system. And from an economic point of view, this is part of the um, uh, additional um, plan, uh, the development and um, economic approach to um, a closed loop and why the business model is um, opened up by closed loop because we can match to the existing surface system with exactly what the questioner is suggesting with a certain pressure because the surface system has uh, minimum uh, pressures and uh, or uh, may have different pressures given uh, the surface system requirements, whether they be over sea flip system or flash systems, for example. So yes, a downboard, downboard heat exchanger, we control the working, everything about the downboard for working fluid, um, and that allows us to also control the pressure but it also affects the pressure in the resource. And it's the delta T um, and the delta P in the resource that uh, affects how much um, heat and steam is coming in, in this example, into the downboard heat exchanger for condensation. Did I answer that question? Exactly, and I'm getting more impressed. I mean, no matter you are involved so many uh, energy projects in your background uh, for a lawyer. I mean, you're talking like a geoscientist. <laughs> so welcome to our world. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe uh, in line with your model, another related question is uh, in two phase. 
at one asking for the closed loop for direct use applications. Can it be used for retrofitting existing central chiller plants? For example, replacing the entire cooling tower with a closed loop direct use system. Um, uh, yes, uh, we, we think so. We have not done that yet. And if the questioner wants to get in touch with us, we'll we'd be happy to talk to them about that. But that is one of the uh, potential plans. Uh, but we haven't we haven't executed that yet. But it is, it is uh, considered an opportunity. Yeah, and the second phase of the question is related to the power generation. Is any recommended modeling guidelines for a minimum depth to enable build a closed loop? or a minimum distance between injection and production wells to get the optimal heat exchange? Well, and we don't, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't really use in our closed loop system an injection and production well. However, um, if we're using a coaxial approach uh, and uh, in a particular closed loop situation, such as this one, um, we have modeled that if you have our closed loop, uh, this well, 80 meters away from a, uh, a similar well, that there will be no thermal interference. And this is one of the reasons that closed loop, uh, have from an environmental point of view, can higher can can capture more heat from the resource and also have a lower footprint on the surface and require less land, because we we don't need to pull uh, water from the entire uh, resource. We, and as long as these wells are 80 meters apart, uh, they should not thermally interfere. And that, is, and that assumes that it's a hot dry rock resource. So um, does the condensation of the downhole tubing heat exchange result in scaling or is this uh, impacting operating efficiency? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, this is uh, another good question because so many geothermal resources have scaling issues. Uh, but one advantage of the downboard, uh, well, scaling occurs at particular uh, temperatures, saturation temperature um, and saturation pressure or the particular chemistry of that downboard resource. But because we have a closed loop approach and control the temperature and the saturation check pressure and the saturation temperature within the well, we can actually address issues of scaling. Um, now, there are many different types of scaling, of course. So the ability to vary the flow of the closed loop system to minimize uh, the scaling is an is a, uh, important advantage of this closed loop application. And controlling the temperature of the well is very helpful in that. And indeed, we've shown to some customers that certain types of uh, scaling should not occur at all uh, because of the temperature changes that we can control in the, in the downboard heat exchanger. Thank you very much again. Another audience is wondering that um, in a closed loop system, uh, you are working with conduction of heat. So how do you explain that you get more power than in a conventional system, which is using convection? Well, actually, we don't. Um, this is uh, back to our spectrum uh, slide. Um, if the world is uh, conventional systems are excellent in high permeability areas, and I think that's underlying your uh, the questioner's question. Um, but the rest of the world is not necessarily just hot, dry rock. Instead, there's a whole range of convection ability between these two extremes. Now, convection may not be sufficient, the permeability may not be sufficient uh, in order to allow a conventional hydrothermal well to produce, uh, certainly not to produce naturally. But, that, but um, that doesn't mean there's not convection through the resource to some degree. And indeed, our project at uh, the geysers uh, here in California is with the idea of using steam. Uh, these steam wells would uh, can produce uh, to the surface, but when they do, they lose water from the resource. So the advantages of using convection in the form of steam or in, in liquid are still maintained without 
having to degrade or risking a de degradation of the resource by losing water from the resource. So we are not look we are not focused purely on um, uh, hot dry, dry rock projects. And in fact, most of our customers are working with some level of convection in the resource that is sufficient for a well retrofit with the closed loop or an expansion of the resource with closed loop to take advantage of the convection that is there, even if it's not sufficient for a um, conventional geothermal project. Now we do have a project we completed last year uh, for testing in Japan that was a hot dry rock project. Um, but uh, of course there are greater challenges with hot dry rock than there are with uh, high temperature conventional geothermal resources. So another question in line with that is wondering what would be the minimum temperature and I don't, I don't know if it's only related to temperature, but to generate power in an economical way. Well, um, the, it, it, it begins, well, economics uh, starts or ends, depending on your perspective, with what the price of power is. So <laughs> in many locations of the world, some places in Europe, the price of power is very high and the price of, uh, and in Japan, it's very high as well. So a project that doesn't make sense in California might make wonderful sense in, from an economic point of view in Japan or some places in Europe, for example, in Italy. So we're, um, there's no actual minimum temperature uh, or a depth. It's all based, uh, we, we do a modeling across the spectrum and design each particular uh, wells or wells for the particular resource with a cost benefit analysis in mind as to what how much you can spend on a closed loop well and have it be economic and have it be an attractive levelized cost of energy um, yeah, but again many uh, depending on the price of energy in that area and whether the uh, whether there's a feed-in tariff and whether the price of energy in that area also takes into account the fact that um, this is a this is a base load resource it's always on and we don't have the problem with wind and solar being intermittent uh, resources for renewable energy so depending on the pricing and the type of pricing and whether there is a, a reward for having base load production uh, different projects will make sense at different temperatures so maybe in line with the economics, I can raise another question, wondering why would time to revenue for a new field development be less than conventional development if both required surface and subsurface developments? Um, please repeat the question. Uh, the audience is wondering uh, mm -hmm. why the economics is different than I mean, generating, uh, developing a closed loop system comparing to a conventional system where in the end you both require surface and subsurface development studies at both. Or yeah, work at in, some way, in some ways, uh, the economics are the same from an uh, initial project development uh, position, but we know, for example, that it, we can use existing resources and existing resources um, that can't be used uh, with conventional, as again on this diagram, uh, because of, uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it be scaling or the high, uh, or not having sufficient uh, permeability water resource compression, it can be used by uh, a closed loop system. So this is a big advantage of closed loop and, why, and a good example of why um, the, a conventional uh, business model for geothermal may not make sense. Now, we do work with existing geothermal uh, companies and um, the idea of using the technology uh, with them to take advantage of all of the infrastructure they have and move it into productive projects or expand within those projects. So it's not, uh, we're not, and, well, when we have a conventional geothermal operation, uh, that's great, uh, but it's only where those resources are not producible 
with conventional or the conventional has degraded uh, the resource or can't be used on an expanded basis to be fully economic or produce at scale that our biggest opportunities arise. Just to extend this question, another attendee is wondering uh, what would be the possibility or success of retrofitting of an existing well uh, in line with the, uh, I mean, your design may need some specific borehole diameters required or other things and to retrofit of an existing well, you need some extra additional costs like vacuum tubing, surface pumps, heat exchanger, yeah. And asking if you have some examples of the crossover point where the additional capex and like the reduced heat capture of the closed loop uh, retrofit fail to uh, achieve profitability. Yeah, so we had then our demonstration project at COSO, uh, California was a, a retrofit. We didn't drill that well. Our project um, at uh, the geysers um, is, uh, starts with a retrofit of an existing uh, well. So the, these are examples, and of course, you don't have the cost of drilling the well or lining the, uh, the well, and, um, and also the surface system is a cost we don't have to incur. So, but yes, the downboard heat exchanger is, um, and uh, the vacuum insulated tubing, if we're using vacuum insulated tubing, is a, a substantial cost. But when you take out all of the costs associated with developing the project in the first place and drilling the wells, many of these retrofits can become economic and be done very quickly. And so we have projects around the world that uh, when we sit down with a initial uh, geothermal existing owner, almost always they ask first about retrofits because they have often a, uh, a number of wells that are either idle or not producing. And they give us a, um, a group of wells to look at and to identify the wells that are best suited for both in terms of the physical diameter, dimensions and depths and temperatures and pressures in the well um, and otherwise to be retrofit and become economic. But against the background of many of these wells are simply plug in abandoned liabilities. Uh, there's a big cost advantage in retrofits but not all wells are, are subject to retrofit, but many are. And that's our first step with a new customer looking, uh, uh, which is an existing geothermal owner, is to identify the wells that are most appropriate for a retrofit. And another attendee is wondering the approximate installation cost of the coaxial well exchanger. Yeah, well, they, uh, it depends. Uh, the, the vacuum insulated tubing, if we're using vacuum insulated tubing, um, is uh, and the liner for the vacuum insulated tubing are the biggest material costs, but that depends entirely on the depth of the well. So at our demonstration project at uh, COSO, we only went down a thousand feet because we were demonstrating um, the, the technology. And so that was not expensive uh, at all. But if you're, but depending on the depth of the, where we're going into the resource, uh, that expense will be different. And uh, uh, we can, so once we know how deep we're going in the well for optimal performance, we can then project and estimate and provide a proposal for the length and diameter of the well, uh, assuming we're using vacuum insulated tubing, so that the liner is metal and the uh, and the vacuum insulated tubing itself is is metal as well and these are heavy so uh, a long well will have a heavy vacuum or downboard heat exchanger and then the installation of the back of the install of the downboard heat exchanger uh, has a cost that's a, uh, that can uh, of installation that is usually best handled by having a workover rig. We don't need a full rig. We're not, uh, we're not drilling wells, but a workover rig can handle the weight associated with this uh, process. So the key, um, so there's no minimum or maximum for that matter cost for the downboard heat exchanger, but those are the key factors. The diameter, which will infect the, the, the weight and the cost of the 
of the downpour heat exchanger and the length, obviously. What is the uh, lifespan of the closed loop system lifetime? And um, can you tell us what are the parameters affecting the lifetime? Oh, what are the what? Sorry? Sorry, I'm not hearing you very well. What, what are the what? Uh, what is the lifetime of a closed loop system and the parameters uh, affecting that? Sorry, lifetime, yes. Uh, well, we project that uh, from the close, uh, we often model based on a 25 year uh, lifetime, but there's no particular reason why uh, the lifetime should end at 25 years, but uh, that's a uh, 25 years is a pretty conventional lifetime in the geothermal world. And um, depending on the resource lifetime, that is often the constraint. So for example, this diagram shows our closed loop system that would preserve the resource. So a resource may only last with conventional geothermal for a few years, but we expect given the, um, the lifetime of the materials we're using, uh, both the liners and uh, vacuum insulated tubing, uh, that it would last 25 years or more and could uh, potentially last much longer, but we, we usually use a 25 year lifetime in our economic projections. You have mentioned a couple of, of the studies you have already provided, but the attendees are wondering, can you name that you have really an existing and successful application uh, to be demonstrated? Um, we, we don't have a long-term uh, project uh, in operation yet. Uh, we anticipate that will be uh, in the next two years. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that with this interesting technology and with the, um, now we are working together with really other innovative companies integrated together, so you will run over so many projects in the coming years. Uh, so yes. let me... and that and then indeed uh, our project at the geysers uh, and we have a project in the Philippines that's very similar um, which may actually uh, be completed prior to the project in the geysers and that that is focused on this steam in two phase well structure and uh, for Southeast Asia in particular there are a lot of two phase locations but we also have two phase locations in in Europe uh, for this technology but there are other versions of our uh, our uh, closed loop technology, not just the green loop um, for steam and two phase wells. Uh, but they got, they, uh, we did receive a, another a grant from the California Energy Commission for uh, $2.7 million of public information. And we're working with Calpine at the geysers. And uh, of course, the, that project is, is already underway, but it's not completed yet. And the, the view at that location is for expanding it to a much larger uh, applicability because the geysers is generally a steam dominated resource and steam dominated resources are perfect for the technology I have on the screen uh, here and two phase uh, dominated resources. Do you have Joe, any uh, typical LCOE for the closed loop projects? It, it depends completely. So, for example, an, an LCOE um, that we propose to a customer will be based on the price of energy in that area. Uh, but for, you know, California, for example, we uh, usually have an LCOE at uh, five or six or seven cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and in, in uh, Japan, where uh, many projects make sense at a much higher LCOE, so we can go into the resources uh, deeper and into hot dry rock resources and um, have LCOEs that are much higher, but still profitable because uh, the price of energy is higher in many locations such as Japan and Northern Europe. Another interesting question is, how about retrofitting abundant oil and gas wells? <laughs> Thank you for that question, whoever uh, mentioned it. Yes, we have, a, uh, we have uh, patents on a uh, technology we call Green Drive, which uh, takes the, the downboard heat exchanger approach for uh, taking geothermal heat from the resource and magnetically coupling it 
to a, um, a traditional downbore pump. So it can be pump, it can pump oil and gas wells. So one approach is green drive. And if you can make the oil and gas industry more green by using green energy to pump those wells, you can decrease the cost of pumping and also um, uh, produce, um, uh, have a, an alternative to electronic submersible pumps or power brought to a uh, oil and gas resource for pumping. Another alternative, and maybe this is what the question is after, is can we simply put the uh, downboard heat exchanger in an oil and gas well? And uh, we were uh, previously in the Shell Game Changer program. Our first project for them was to look at this very question. And as you would imagine, it depends on the heat and the diameter of the well. So we do have a project now uh, that we're doing uh, with uh, Baker Hughes to look at that very alternative. Uh, and, but the, not all oil and gas wells are going to be good candidates, uh, even though they are plug and abandon liabilities for the oil and gas companies. But some, many of them will be. And because there are millions, of, tens of millions, I am told, of oil and gas wells, even if only a small percentage, if only 5% of the oil and gas wells of the world can be retrofit with a downboard heat exchanger approach, um, that is still a very large market. So we're currently working on that uh, separately, not in the geothermal space, uh, working with existing geothermal owners, but with oil and gas companies that are looking uh, to for a solution for many uh, plug and abandon liabilities in the oil and gas world, some of which are hot enough and some of which are have the sufficient diameter for this to work. That's really an interesting area, especially through the energy transition. Decarbonizing oil and gas fields most probably may change a lot for the future. Yes. And the site of utilizing geothermal energy, let's say. Right. And we're, so, and we're, also, we're also looking at, uh, at ways uh, with uh, some of our strategic partners to make the uh, downbore heat exchanger narrower so it will fit into more oil and gas wells too. And we have a project uh, on that in process now too. Yeah, another wondered question coming. Are the materials in the green loop always the same or do they account for re resource uh, chemistry? Um, are the materials? Uh, yes, we. Uh, one of the reasons we have a strategic alliance with Valorac is they can uh, provide different materials for the downbore heat exchanger uh, that take into account the resource chemistry. And in fact, <laughs> just yesterday we were designing with them a downbore um, heat exchanger specific specifications on a project where uh, the discussion of whether to use an alloy, uh, special metal alloy to uh, uh, avoid corrosion and uh, create a longer lifetime for that particular chemistry of the resource is appropriate. So yes, we work with, uh, with companies uh, and mostly Valorac on the tubulars that will design the and tailor the, and the uh, one of the things that's specific about what Greenfire does is we tailor each well to the resource. So that is part of the tailoring, is dealing with the downboard chemistry and using the right materials. So uh, maybe I can bound two of the questions together, because during your presentation, you mentioned that you can also use other uh, fluids uh, through the uh, working fluids to the system. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the attendees is wondering if water ammonia mixture can be used in your system. Would it work? Well, uh, I think we've looked at ammonia, but I'm not a, a technical guy. They're in the other room. Uh, okay. We have we have looked at uh, and did non extensive modeling of isopentane and isobutane as part of uh, as an alternative working fluids. Um, and we uh, have also modeled and have a paper that's downloadable on our resource about using supercritical CO2. And many of these fluids are, have advantages because compared to water, they're more dense. And so the, the 
density of the cold fluid going down is much greater uh, than water, and the density of the uh, than the density of the hot fluid coming up. So that density differential can create a stronger thermosiphon. And indeed, in our project at COSO, we had to pump the water down the downpour heat exchanger, but we didn't have to pump uh, the supercritical CO2. So depending on the working fluid, it can affect the, um, the pumping requirements, the par parasitic power required for uh, the downpour heat exchanger to work. Uh, but I don't recall uh, whether we've looked at uh, ammonia or not. But we have looked at many different working fluids, uh, including refrigeration uh, fluids such as R134A. As I follow you, I'm pretty sure that you are also following the techn technological developments in the industry as close as myself. Uh, and also one of the attendees is wondering how would the availability of advanced drilling methods may impact your business, especially oh, if you're going to model the hot dry racks, for instance? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a great, that's, uh, it'll be, have a big impact and we're very uh, optimistic. And one of the reasons we're um, working closely with oil and gas companies is to make sure that we are using the most advanced drilling techniques as the economics of these projects is always uh, going to be affected by the cost of drilling and uh, the various alternatives in, in drilling, both completion of different, uh, di uh, different uh, diagrams and spectrum of the, uh, of the downbore wells, but uh, in particular, the rate of penetration is uh, very key to the economics of these projects if we're drilling new wells, not relevant for uh, retrofits, but our goal and the goal of our investors and most of our geothermal customers are to expand at scale. And that's gonna require lots of new wells. And with lots of new wells, all of the advances in drilling technology, both in terms of rate of penetration and in terms of um, uh, drilling at high temperature locations but will be very relevant to each particular project. Great question. And before we close, because we are almost coming to the end of our time, uh, most of the, I mean, almost all of the attendees appreciated the presentation very much, Joe. Uh, everybody you. mentions that it's very interesting. And a couple of them would like to contact you in asking how they can reach Greenfire. Okay. Well, here's our, uh, I think we have, uh, here's our, uh, just go to our website, uh, greekfireenergy.com, and there's an info opportunity to talk to us, contact us there. And thank you very much. We look forward to the contacts and uh, appreciate everyone uh, uh, being open minded and looking for and uh, considering new technologies in geothermal it's a phenomenal geothermal is a phenomenal resource the heat beneath our feet is the answer to so many questions in the world today but we have to figure out better ways to use it and um, being open to closed loop technology is very helpful but not just for us but uh, we think for the planet thank you uh, thank you so but just one final uh, question from my end which i wonder where do you see green fire energy in the following a couple of years? Uh, where will we be in a couple of years? Yeah. <laughs> well, we we expect to have, as one of the questioners um, um, suggested, uh, operating uh, full scale operating projects in a couple of years, and that will be a very important uh, 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 position for us instead of simply uh, retrofitting existing wells to look at um, uh, to make a, um, a well that's unproductive or an idle well, we will then be able to do full-scale projects with new wells in existing resources and start drilling these very large projects. So we hope to be working at scale, large scale, in a couple of years. And right now, we're mostly working on retrofits. Thank you for your time, Joe. It was really a fantastic and excellent presentation. We have learned a lot and it's very nice to see companies investing in geothermal and trying to provide, working to provide 
the next generation a sustainable and green future. Yes. Also, thank to the, all the attendees for their time. And we will be back with our next webinar, which will be announced later through our social media.